Hey, thanks so much for finding the video. Do us a favor. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe. Be sure to leave your comment. We love to interact. Enjoy the video. Let me start because we haven't talked since the Durante Jones hire. Uh, when you were here last week, it was sort of the fallout after the Ryan Nielsen stuff fell apart. So Durante Jones is the guy. Uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Man, it's uh, been a long time since I talked to Durante. Uh, I remember him here in, uh, in 02, uh, coaching for Coach Darrell Day. And uh, man, that was a pretty good staff there. Jay Thomas was there, later became a head coach at uh, Nichols and and then at uh, at Northwestern. And Charles Kelly uh, was the secondary coach uh, mm. at that time. Now, Charles, man, he had a wild ride. Uh, he was here, then he went to Georgia Tech, where he was the coordinator there. And then goes to Florida State. They win a national title. Oh, yeah. And he becomes a defensive coordinator. And now he's the associate head coach uh, on defense and the safeties coach at Alabama. So, you know, man, Durante's had a lot of things. But, man, he's had a lot of W-2s now. <laughs> man, he can fill up a room uh, full of them. And I, and I remember when he went to Generet and Franklin. And he used to come to our camps. One thing with Durante, he could talk. And I told him one time, man, listen, if I didn't know any better, I'd swear you from the bayou. Because, man, <laughs> he can talk. A uh, great personality, a guy that um, you could tell was a very ambitious guy. And, but he, and he's kind of soaked it all in uh, pretty well. And, uh, again, when you've coached that many areas, uh, I, I sort of lost track of him for a little while. And next thing you know, I, I saw where he got hired by Norm Chow, who Ed was uh, on the same staff with at USC. Norm was the head coach at Hawaii. Mm. And then I sort of tracked him again afterwards. Uh, he was at Hawaii, and next thing you know, he's Wisconsin. And and uh, he had a stint in between there, I, I think, in the Canadian Football yep. League and then uh, Cincinnati, Minnesota. So guy who's a – you can tell. Matt, it don't take you long. He's a really good communicator. Uh, out on the field, uh, the, and and I think he, the one thing about him is in watching some of those practices and games, he he was not a real demonstrative guy, and a lot of times defensive coaches are, are that. You could tell he he's very calm, uh, sort of speak in the storm, and and I like that in a coach. Uh, I can't tell you what type of scheme he's going to run. Uh, at LSU, uh, and it's going to be variety. And, and Ed said that numerous times that he wanted a coach that could give him a variety of sets. And part of it, too, is I think what he saw last year was a hard-headed coach that was married to a system, was not going to change, and the, the, the world is a lot different from yeah. all I know from 2002 to today. And so – you have to have a varied amount of schemes, and it's all about personnel and down and distance personnel, which you see so much of in the NFL. And so he he's had that experience in doing that. A very good teacher uh, from everybody that has been around him, understanding that. And so um, I, I'm interested in how it's going to work out and the staff around him because I do think that is going to be huge for LSU. Uh, to have a good teaching staff around him and for Durante to have the vision of what he wants to do defensively and then being able to get those sets out there because it's just not going to look 4 3, 3 4, whatever. You got to do it hybrid today. Uh, no one runs just uh, strictly 4 3 or 3 4. This stuff about, well, you know, man, they went from 3 4 to 4 3 is the personnel there. No. <laughs> What are you talking about? It, it changes from down to down. And you have to change as a coach. I, I think last year that was a big part of Bo that sunk his boat. He was going to do it his way, and it, like it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago, sink or swim. Well, we know what happened. The boat sunk. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, that, that had nothing to do with personnel. That had everything to do with the fact that you didn't quite adjust. And, yes, uh, he, he, he wanted an aggressive system, a lot of man coverage, that sort of thing. But we see today 
that I think this is a world of college and pro football where you're going to give up yardage. It comes down to uh, getting turnovers, red zone efficiency. Matt, bottom line, uh, you, you're going to give up yardage. You, you cannot stop this train, but you can slow it down a little bit. And, you know, if, if you can give up three instead of seven, okay, um, I think my offense can go out there and score a touchdown. And and I think that's part of it, and you get a turnover. And I think that was one of the things last year with Bo. He, they did get the turnovers that they were looking for. They just couldn't get any stops. Mm-hmm. And so you got to get both. you you got to be able to get turnovers, and you got to be able to get – Red zone stops inside the twenty yard line. Now a lot of those big plays were beyond twenty. I know when I visited Ed in November, he was livid about that. He had a like a, a list of, of all the the plays of over twenty yards, twenty five yards, thirty yards, and his deal was at this point. I think they had given up over fifty four plays of twenty yards or more. That's mm. unacceptable, uh, totally unacceptable at that particular stage. And you just sometimes you're not going to get a pass rush. You, you actually got to cover people, and and so some of that too is on the players. Uh, I get it, but I do think, uh, and the way the schedule works out, aren't we going to get a real good early look at this? No matter what you want to think about Pac-12 football, the one thing I do know about Chip Kelly, he can sling it, and and, and yep. his and he's got some people there that in the pitch and catch game are very good. And the same people that tell you it's going to be a breeze, we're going to kick the crap out of them in in the Rose Bowl. Oh, yeah? Uh, What happened last year in game one against that Pac-12 coach? Mm -hmm. What happened there? So, man, you're going to get an early test of it, and that's going to be a critical game because if you see that, the signs there, that, man, you coming along and you're able to get stops, you're able to get pressure, you're able to get turnovers, I think, just like in life, there's a little bit of confidence that gets built up. I, I don't never believe in momentum. Momentum lasts to the next game, and you get your teeth kicked in the first time, and then you forget about momentum. But if you got confidence in what you're doing is working, and you're going to bust your butt for that, uh, Coach, and you got a belief in what he's doing, it'll be an interesting spring to see all this mesh with two now young coordinators who haven't done it being given the baton to say hey guys let's roll with it Mm. and see how it goes because what's the excuse this year you got 20 of 22 starters coming back none that's a lot of folks coming back so you can't say well we lost you can say we lost people to the nfl and you will uh, lose people to the nfl uh, draft, no question about it. But now you're getting 20 starters back. You're you got a new staff, and coaching does matter. I, I I don't care how you cut it. I think last year, which maybe got kind of undercut a little bit, was not only did you lose players, but you lost what you lost in the coaching ranks, and it showed up uh, immensely, mm-hmm. uh, game to game. It it showed up. So now the young kids got a little bit of experience to them, and, and Durante, you know, he's going to come in here, and we'll, we'll see. I, I do think personnel settings are important on defense. I've talked to enough defensive coaches, college and the pro game, and, and, you know, they emphasize that, man, you know, to have that third down defense, that's right. And now, you know, you playing first down like third down because the offenses are thinking that way. Okay, if we can get seven yards – on first down, okay, man, second and three is really manageable. Even third and three is really manageable. I can still run the football then. And so it's um, interesting with Durante and uh, and I, you know. But again, it's been a long time yeah. uh, that I've talked to him, and that he had a memorable deal. And I didn't see it, but I heard about it because I have a cousin of mine, uh, Owen <laughs> Babe. Uh, he's a Babe. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, I was told that Durante had a pet snake, and uh, he got loose one time in the football building. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and my my cousin was fixing to whack that snake. That uh, was your cousin Mike. So Daryl Day was on the show with us on Tuesday, and he told this story. 
And he talked about how the snake got loose and the eight foot boa constrictor and somebody was going to chop its head off with, with a shovel. No, no, no. That's my cousin Owen. He, you know, come on. You know, I, I'm not. I'm not afraid of. Of course, I'm not it was afraid your of, cousin. <laughs> I'm not afraid of snakes. Okay, I am. That, oh, come on. You got to get over that. No, Mike. Uh, that's no, a, that's no, just a phobia, with, man. Growing up where I grew up at, you know, on the bay, and I still got a home here. Uh, listen, snakes. Uh, you know, that's the least of my worries. Uh, you know. <laughs> Man, I, I've seen a coyote as big as a German shepherd <laughs> running. <laughs> no, I, no, I can send you pictures. You can show it next week uh, because right next to my home is a uh, where, where they keep cattle and horses and that sort of thing. And you know, and the coyotes now, man, he, these suckers are big, yeah. Yeah, as big as a uh, like a big dog, a German shepherd. And um, man, I hate to say this, but but I guess I, it doesn't really matter. I, I feed there, there are some donkeys that are in the pasture. And one thing with a donkey, he got no fear. No fear of that coyote or anything else. Mm-hmm. But I'll feed him. You know, I got extra bread I, and stuff like that, so I'll go feed him by the fence. And uh, so here's the deal. They, they know I do it, so at about 3.30 every afternoon, they let out a yell uh, that, that would wake up the dead. You know, they wanting me to get the attention to go feed them. Yeah. So one morning uh, about 4.30, Man, I, I didn't hear it, and I get woke up and said, hey, listen, your kids are hollering. You better get up. I said, well, kids, what are you talking about? My wife says, listen, you can hear this donkey screaming. I mean, bloody murder. Mm. So I get my jeans. I go walk across the road, and the pasture's right there, and I look, and he has clipped uh, a coyote, and I mean a big one, too. Uh, <laughs> that coyote got a little bit too close to that donkey, and he back kicked him in the head, and it was game, set, match. You know, like Cosell, down goes Fraser, down goes Fraser. No, that coyote was out. Yeah. <laughs> so, of all the places I expected this to go, a coyote no, no, getting no. kicked in the head by a donkey on the bayou is not how I thought we were going to start this, Mike. On that, on that no, note. You, no, <laughs> you talk about out cold. He, he was DOA on arrival. So I call <laughs> up the owner and, and tell him, and he's like, you're going to have to help me put him you know, in the truck because you know, he's a, a little up in age. I said, okay, that's oh. fine. So I jumped the fence. And when I caught, he was, the act, coyote was actually still a little warm, you know, but here's the best part. When I walked across, when the gentleman called me to go help him, the donkey had actually grabbed him by the nape of the neck and was carting him around like the world's heavyweight championship belt. <laughs> <laughs> now, until I went feed her. And then she calmed down a little bit. She just dropped the cut. I can't eat that now. Oh. And so, but she was more worried about the bread and, and whatever else I had in my hand. But no, you, you, I'm not worried about snakes. I used to go. Uh, That's where this. I was wondering where this. I was like, where the hell did this go? <laughs> no, uh, because I had a, a friend of mine who wanted to always go fishing at Lake Verrett. Okay. And and man, they had snakes all over the place. So I used to say it was like Snake Verrett. Because, I mean, they had snakes all over. And I used to go crawfish, and my great-grandmother had property. We used to go, uh, you know, bait the, uh, <laughs> bait everything and then go pick up the nets. And they, all, they always had a few snakes in there. So, you know, you got to the point where you got used to And they got used to us. And, you know, they, you know, I didn't do them no harm. They didn't do me any harm. So we went on uh, about our business of uh, <laughs> catching crawfish. But, uh, no, I'm not a, a afraid of snakes. But my, but my cousin Owen... He was fixing to decapitate this <laughs> <laughs> I thought that Durant they had. And oh thank goodness God. that somebody kind of calmed his nerves. I'm not sure which coach it was, if it was Coach Day or somebody else. But, man, listen, you find an eight-foot snake rolling around on the floor. Uh, you saying, I know one thing. No. The color that snake tells you. Uh, he ain't your ordinary snake at eight foot long. Oh. All right, before I get sidetracked again, let me ask you about the Senior Bowl. I know you were there earlier this week. Um, quick rundown, Mike, of how the uh, how the LSU guys, the three LSU guys, are doing so far this week. I thought Jabril looked great uh, in the coverage part of the game, and boy, that's that's big for him because that's that's his uh, his ace card. He's got to throw that down. Okay, he's not a real big guy to begin with. He he's almost built like a safety, and so. Man, he, he matched up 
really well against them. They got some pretty good tight ends there. And I thought he really did a nice job with the backs, with the tight ends coming out of the backfield. You could tell he's skilled in that and getting that, that, that body backwards. I think he really did himself well there. And especially now, everybody, you, you can't play linebacker if you can cover. You're running out of downs if you can't, okay? Uh, so I thought he did a real nice job there. Racy, we get it with him. And I had a lot of people ask me, man, how good of a special teams player he is? I said, man, he's really good. Uh, he'll be a core special teams player for eight, ten years in this league. He's that good of a guy on the special teams part. And I think like Russell Gage, he'll be a better receiver in the pros than he was in college. Huh, why? I just think that developmental stage, he's a big man receiver. And I had an LSU coach tell me this, and I sort of believe that he's probably right because he would know. He told me if you put him out on the track, uh, Jamar, uh, Terrace Marshall, and Racy, the fastest guy is McMath. Hmm. Yeah, man, so he's a big man who can scoot. Now, he needs a little bit of work on on getting out of his cuts and breaks a little bit cleaner. Uh, sometimes he almost comes to a little bit of a halt uh, before he can cut hard. And, I, and But you can work on that and get better at that. And he's got good hands, and he's not afraid to go over the middle. And, again, he brings you immediate uh, work <laughs> as a gunner on special teams where – Man, in the open field, he, he he's a threat to pull you down. And so uh, I think that part you will see. You know, when they're going to do these special teams drills and, and stuff during the game, man, Racy will stand out there. Jacoby's a, a, a kind of an inconsistent guy from an evaluation standpoint. You leave him one-on-one deep in the middle of the field, he's going to get beat, okay? He's a hybrid sort of strong safety outside linebacker type. He's much better closer to the line of scrimmage than he is deep in coverage. He's got good hands for the interception. I think sometimes either he doesn't track the ball well or he can't find it real quick, but he's had some difficulties with that, but he's a good open field tackler. He's terrific off the edge as a blitz guy, and you're seeing now more and more teams, okay, they'll go to a three-man front, All of a sudden, they drop seven back, and the safety comes in, either from the edge or up the middle, and gets pressure. And I think he'll help in that way. He'll be a really good special teams performer also. Again, his negative is he's not real quick. He's more fast than quick. So, you know, you kind of want to line him up where I think I can get a mismatch with him in one-on-one coverage deeper downfield. And again, and you saw that during the practice sessions that, man, you know, he's effective and he knows how to use his hands to get off of a block really well, almost like a a defensive lineman. And it's wop, wop, you know, almost like an MMA fighter uh, that he can get around you pretty well. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think you know, Jabril was the guy that, man, had a bit of a buzz. And you could tell, you know, a lot of NFL people, they don't like to say too much because they're afraid, like, oh, I- I'm the only one watching this practice and sees that Jabril Cox can cover. Come on. <laughs> they got 300 people there watching the same thing. You can't keep that a secret. Cox really excelled in the coverage part of the game. Mm. Mike, um, got a couple of minutes here. Who else? Every year when you go down to the Senior Bowl, I always ask you this, and you throw out names. Like, in years past, you mentioned, like, Josh Allen or Ali Marpet, you know, guys that yep. that sort of flash. They get to the Senior Bowl, maybe we don't know about, and then they show up and you go, oh. Uh, anybody like that this year? Well, I can tell you one thing. The baddest dude on the planet here in Alabama was Kadarius Tony from Florida. Hmm. He was the baddest cat out there. Hey, nobody covered him. No one. He was beating them like he was a senior in high school and you were in the sixth grade. <laughs> there was nobody close most of the time. Now, Aaron Robinson, who was a former Alabama corner, and he went to Central Florida, he was the only guy that even was close on some plays. And and he's an interesting player because he played a lot in a slot, so he's got some versatility, slot on the edge. I thought it was dominated uh, by the interior people offensive line-wise, and a dude – and if you watch him play, 
you saw more belly than anything else. And it's Quentin Minert from Wisconsin Whitewater. He, he could play guard and center. Now, he's built like Babe Ruth. <laughs> he he took out the belt and he spanked everybody's backside as a run blocker and also in the pass protection part of the game. I thought he did a really really good job uh, in all the practice sessions. He did extremely well, and I was surprised because, like Marpet, I questioned how well he could pass protect. <laughs> there was no question afterwards. Hmm. Uh, Quinn did a really good job. Uh, Dwayne Estridge, uh, again, another kind of a smaller college receiver. He'll be a slot guy. He caught the ball really, really well, and he showed an extra gear in space. Um, Josh Palmer uh, from Tennessee. Uh, man, how, how can Tennessee keep screwing up these athletes? I, I got no clue. But <laughs> he's a big man receiver from, the Can- from Canada, and, and I thought really looked good. But I thought – Quinn Merritt, and you'll see him, Wisconsin uh, Whitewater, uh, offensive guard. I thought he really, really played well. Uh, but, but that was no question. And, and Dylan Raditz, also from North Dakota State. And it'll be the evaluation, where do you play him? Do you play him inside at guard or do you play him at tackle? Uh, I thought also did a really good job. I thought, from what I heard, he had struggled the first day of practice, but then he caught on real quickly. But Kadarius Tony. He's a bad man out there. Now, he got overshadowed because of Pitts and what Trask did throwing the football. Mm -hmm. All I'm telling you is, come pick 25 in round one, he's going to be off the board. Ross Dellinger just tweeting, uh, LSU finalizing a deal to hire Miami defensive coordinator Blake Baker to join the coaching staff to coach linebackers. Uh, Baker, former Tulane linebacker, has stops at Texas as a GA and Louisiana Tech as a defensive coordinator. All right, Mike Dettelier is with us. We'll talk quarterbacks for the Saints in just a second. Mike, um, you know Blake Baker? A uh, little thumbnail there? Yes, sir. Uh, I remember him when he played at Tulane early 2000s. I think maybe 2000, 2003, and four mm-hmm. uh, in, in that range. And then he goes to Louisiana Tech. Now, he worked under Manny Diaz there. Okay. And then when Manny left Louisiana Tech to go to Miami, he took the job. Um, and so, uh, no, I, no, I think Diaz went to Mississippi State first. Uh, so what I remember was that he, he did a really nice job at Tech because Tech's defense, listen, that was not what you think about Tech about. Mm-hmm. But their defense has really played well uh, under Manny. And then Blake came in, did a really nice job with them. So Manny gets the job at Miami of Florida, and Blake followed him there. Uh, really, uh, what I call a hot wire coach, man. He lets you know real quickly uh, what's going on and what's not. Uh, great relationship guy with players. He had a feel for what they wanted to do and what Manny wanted to do defensively. And it didn't surprise me that when Diaz got the head coaching job, that Baker was the guy that he was going to call. They had a really good working relationship. He trusted that Baker could could kind of do all the field work for him. And uh, so I was told a year ago that he was very interested in the job at LSU as defensive coordinator. Oh, okay. And so he's, you know, he's a Texas guy, but he's got a lot of Louisiana ties. He knows the area very well as a recruiter. He's a really good linebackers coach. I mean, that's his specialty, uh, is, is coaching linebackers, and I think that that will certainly pay off. But he understands the game. He's coming from Miami of Florida and the ACC where they sling it. Well, they sling it around all over. But <laughs> uh, one of the things is he's a really good teacher. And you look back at those tech defenses, underrated, very underrated back then for what they were able to do. And it was all about – Pressure break the pipe. Get pressure on the quarterback. And the linebackers being able to cover. And that, uh, that's a good hire. I'd heard that there was some interest uh, there. And so that is a really, really good hire. Because you needed somebody who had, I think, a little bit of experience here uh, to go along with Durante. And getting him as and he, a former coordinator at a couple different spots 
and he knows the area to recruit, that's a big catch for Ed Ogeron to grab him. That's a really big catch. And again, I had been told he had an interest in the coordinator's job a year ago. Mike, let me ask one short, like sort of obvious follow-up, and I talked about this. Baker, it looked like this might happen, and I, I don't know the background here, but why would you leave a spot where you're a defensive coordinator in a Power Five to be a position coach at at another Power Five? It seems like like a sort of a regression to to leave a DC spot. Well, I think too is, you know, he when you look at where the program's going to be, not just for this year, but for next year or the following, the following. I think a lot of times uh, coaches are looking to make that jump. They're looking for a spot where they can become eventually a coordinator or a head coach somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at Durante, and and if it works out this year for LSU defensively, how long do you think he's going to stay here? (laughs) If he wants to be a head coach, Mike, this was his his launch pad, right? I mean, a year or two. A year or two, right. Okay, so it's Blake's launch pad, too. Because you know why it won't be in Miami? Everybody's going to say it's Manny Diaz's job. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's Manny's running the defense. So Manny got a lot of responsibilities as the head coach. Uh, uh, and, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, that, okay, yeah, they do spend time in meeting room, and he is a defensive-oriented coach. But, man, you got to take care of, what, 90 players. you got assistant coaches. you got a lot of things thrown at you each and every day that you got to kind of micromanage. You need a guy you can trust. I think Blake looks at this as a situation where, man, this might be a one and done if it works. And I can put myself in a spot here to be a defensive coordinator, and I might be one and done. Mm. You know, listen, I don't care what assistant coaches say. And I know you played the thing about uh, last week about Coach Payton saying, oh, they got some assistants. They don't want to uh, look at another job. They, don't, they ain't comfortable <laughs> where they at. Man, what? Man, I, uh, introduce me to them guys because I've never seen many of them like that. They got a few, but not, not many. They all looking to be a head coach. Uh, and when you look at his age, you know, again, you bringing in some youth here to be able to relate. And, and, and this is good, would be a long story, but I'll cut it short. No, you're good. I do think that's a big part of college coaching today, to being able to relate to the players and putting them in the right spot. A lot of people, they see, oh, a guy's maybe out of position. Oh, he missed a tackle because maybe he overrun the play. No, you got to know responsibilities here. And that's coachable on where to put them at. Uh, and I'm just saying, go back and look at those defenses at Tech. And how they got after people and got turnovers and got sacks, uh, that was an underrated – because everybody thinks of Louisiana Tech and they think they're throwing it all over the yard. Man, it's just pitch and catch all over. No, they could play some pretty good defense there. Mm-hmm. And that, that was a big loss for Skip uh, when Blake took off to go to Miami or Florida. But I, I can see exactly what he's, what, what's happening here, that he sees this major program and, man, I got a spot. And if if it works out well with Durante, then I'd get a spot to be the D.C. And, uh, again, it's uh, sort of connected dots. It would have been the same thing if it's Marcus Freeman comes in, he's one and done. He's going to be one and done at Notre Dame. If Nielsen had took the job, he'd have been one and done. He'd have been off to the NFL. Things work out for Durante. Uh, tell me that he's going to be there a second year. No, he's going to get a lot of offers. People are going to go after him. Uh, those young coaches today that can coach and have success with it, they're going to have a lot of people after them. So I understand exactly where uh, Blake is going here. And there's connections. I mean, I, I know he, he knows Coach O uh, pretty well. And, again, the connection with him moving a lot has all to do with Manny Diaz. Uh, he was tight, and Manny really trusted him that he would run his defense correctly. Do the New Orleans Saints have enough capital to trade for Matt Stafford? Yeah, you would. Now, again, you're going to have to make it work financially. It'll cost you a first-round pick and something else. Now, Because you're going to have teams interested. Uh, It just ain't one team. Yeah. Uh, The Colts, Washington, uh, Denver, San Francisco, you name it. You're going to have a lot of teams interested in Matt. And I always know this because you you hear it. If you want a player bad enough, you figure out a way to get him on the team. 
financially. If you throw you can throw kind of dummy years onto the contract, sweeten it out, throw it out a few more years. I'm just telling you if you want it. But if you make a mistake there, then I'll tell you something. Hank Stram told me years ago when when he we worked for three years uh, <laughs> when he took Ditka's place. And he told me, he said, the worst mistake in the world is I fell in love with a backup quarterback when I when Lenny got uh, old, Lenny Dawson. Mm. And he said, I convinced myself and I had loyalty to players I shouldn't have. And what happened? It got me fired. Mike Livingston had won us some games, but we had great talent around him. Oh, everybody starts to get a little bit older and you don't have quite the same team. And he said, I'm unemployed. And he said, I had opportunities to trade for young quarterbacks. I had opportunities to trade for a veteran, and I didn't do it. And he said, I tell young coaches today, the worst mistake in the world you make is convincing yourself you got somebody on the roster that can win for you, and you know he can't. Mm. He can make you middle of the road. And he said, middle of the road gets you fired. So this is going to be the biggest decision Sean Payton has made since he uh, signed Drew Brees on what he does for his replacement. And uh, I've, I've told you this: the replacement's not for me is not on the roster today. You're going to either have to draft that guy or go trade for that player. And I think Stafford gives you the best option because you know Watson's going to cost you a ton. And also, okay, if you even if you offer three first round picks, and if the Jets offer three first round picks. I mean, sometimes the Texans need some headwind to make good decisions. I mean, it's like a, a, a sprinter. They need a good breeze behind them uh, to get them moving. But why would I take the 28th pick in the draft when I can have the second or the fifth or the ninth? Come on, common sense tells you that's the pick you're going to take. You're not going to take the 28th pick, and that may be the earliest pick you get if you send him to the Saints. Stafford is an option, and I think he could work out but I'm telling you, Matt, you better do it quick because I got a feeling the Lions are going to try to get rid of Stafford in the same way the Chiefs traded Alex Smith off the week of Super mm. Bowl. And <laughs> I, I, I got a feeling that may happen quickly, and they got a lot of suitors uh, for Stafford. Interesting. Uh, let's get to your questions for Mike. Mark Shelton on Twitter asks, Mike, do you see Ryan Ramchick someday as a starting left tackle? He could play left tackle, no question about it. I don't think that's any question. He could play left tackle, and that that's going to be a big decision on what you do with Tehran as far as contract and, and how you can restructure it. You want him back on that football team. That's the best tandem in pro football when they're both healthy. But I could see Ramchak certainly moving to the left side. Ask Mike, um, do the Saints re-sign Marshawn Lattimore? I know there's been some conversation about Lattimore possibly being involved in a trade for Stafford. I would I would try to do a long term deal with Lattimore. Cover corners are hard to find, really, really hard to find. Uh, ask so Mike, I would do what I could to to get a long term deal with Marshawn. Ask Mike, uh, why is Watson going to cost a ton when nobody wanted him last year and he didn't play this season? What, what <laughs> Watson think, is he? T- I think, Sean Watson. I think I need to screen these questions a little better. Let's go to another one. Uh, ask Mike, does LSU land Brian Thomas on signing day? I think it's a maybe. And and here's why. We had Coach O on the show last Monday, and I I specifically asked him, would you go for a cornerback? And he said, okay, we have a commitment from a defensive lineman. We got a commitment from an offensive lineman. He said, I'm hoping to get a grad transfer. And he laughed, maybe at linebacker. Mm -hmm. And he said, then I'm going back to the board. He said, "I'm, I'm going to get the best players I can get with what's available. Okay, now, wouldn't Brian be on that list? Yeah, he would. But but hasn't it been almost ultra quiet on his part? Yeah. I've heard a and I've heard Alabama. But, man, his recruitment has really been low-key. Uh, you see some of this, you shake your head. He's the flip of that. And I, I think that they would have certainly in that. Man, I would because that cat can play. Yeah. Mike, last one, uh, short on time. Can the Saints get Stafford for Lattimore and a two? And I, that, that's a lot to give up for Matt. I, I would, I, I wouldn't do that deal. Okay. I, w- I would not do that deal. Interesting. Okay. Mike Detillier, SaintsReport.com, MikeDetillier.com. He's on Twitter at Mike Detillier. Saints News Network over at SI.com. He's everywhere, and of course, with us every Thursday here for a full hour. 
Mike D, you're the best. I got to come see that donkey across the street one day, man. We'll do that soon. Uh, yeah, I'll send you pictures. All right, Mike. We'll see you. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for watching. Please leave your comments. I love to interact. And be sure to hit the red subscribe button below.